You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Okay, legend is a pretty big word, and I'm sure that our guests on today's episode of the podcast are just too humble to embrace such an idea, but we have no problem calling them what they deserve to be called, and that is legends. Today, we return to three conversations recorded at B&H hosted conferences and present segments of our talks with Keith Carter, Joyce Tennyson, and Doug Kirkland. For those of you unfamiliar with their work, do yourself a favor and check it out. But in the meantime, a big announcement. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be holding a Fujifilm sweepstakes, the B&H Photography Podcast Fujifilm X. H1 sweepstakes. For those that remember our last sweepstakes, this is sure to get your attention. We're going to be giving away two prizes. The first is a Fujifilm X-H1 mirrorless digital camera with a 35 f2 lens. And the second prize is a Fujifilm X-E3 mirrorless digital camera with a 23 millimeter f2 lens. The sweepstakes are scheduled to start July 26, 2018 and end on August 15th of the same year. More details will be forthcoming, so keep listening to find out the official entry rules, but you can be sure that subscribing to the podcast will be part of the deal. So if you're not a subscriber, what you waiting for? We also want to give a shout out to a listener who left us a great review on iTunes. So PJC56 must be French. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback and thanks for suggesting Michael Paul Smith and his Elgin Park series as a topic for an episode. Great stuff. Please keep those reviews and suggestions coming in. We really do appreciate the feedback. Now on with the show. Keith Carter is an artist, author, educator, and as we found out, an occasional musician. His photography is housed in numerous private and public collections, including the National Portrait Gallery, the Art Institute of Chicago, the San Francisco Museum of Art, and the George Eastman House. He's published 11 books, including From Uncertain to Blue, Mojo, and A Certain Alchemy. To say his work is dreamlike or that he's a poet of the ordinary would just be stealing from Wikipedia, but his large format work draws from the animal world, pop culture, folklore, and religion, and the images are drop-dead gorgeous. Here's Keith. We are being joined by Keith Carter, who is the keynote speaker at Optic 2018 this year, uh, and Keith's great enough to uh, join us. And your, your topic at the uh, your last talk, just before being here, was rolling and tumbling 12-bar photo technique. You got to explain it. <laughs> well, I'm a closet musician. I, I play the guitar. And uh, it occurred to me once uh, that in Western music, there are actually you know, 12 notes in an octave. If you play the piano, there's a C, D flat, D, and you keep going up each half step back to C. If you play the guitar, you start on E, um, you know, F, F sharp, G, and same thing. There are 12 notes. And so on a long plane ride back from Europe, I was thinking, well, I wonder if there's a, um, some sort of correlation in the world of photography, uh, uh, certain notes that everybody plays all the time, but you play them differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so every Western melody you've ever heard are made with those same 12 notes. The thing is, not everybody uses all those notes. And to make it more complicated, it occurred to me that if you play the blues, B.B. King or you know, Eric Clapton, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you play the minor pentatonic scale. The, the point of that is that's only five notes. So all those great melodies are really just five notes. And it occurred to me that, well, in photography, a person such as myself, I probably play the blues. I play about five notes. A lot of digital uh, photographers play a lot of notes, you know. Uh, depends on what kind of melody you wish to to uh, well, it's evolve. The it's the combination of the notes that counts, right? Yeah, and, and you know, how they're played and what they sound like. Mm -hmm. So, uh, essentially, it was a Texas metaphor. Okay. Or, right. as we say, right. metaphor. All right. Now, okay. could that be compared to, and I brought this up a bunch of times before, where I talk about visual signatures, and I, I always joke that I've only taken four or five pictures in my entire life, that they're all 
the same exact composition, different subject matter, but I tend to look at what it is I'm photographing, frame it to fit this thing that seems to click in my head and I go. Is that similar to what you were just talking about, referring to as being six notes or four notes or five notes? I, su I, su I suppose there's a certain similarity, but uh, when I broke it down, um, you know, uh, for example, your subject matter. Mm -hmm. What do you find interesting in the world? That's probably your root note. Okay. Um, what do you find interesting? Uh, so um, depth of field, what is in focus from foreground to background? That's a classic uh, technique uh, in photography. Are you going to use F22 where everything's in focus or are you going to use F1.2 where only one thing's in focus? Uh, that's a note. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a critical decision for you to play or uh, to make. Um, Would that be a note or a phrasing? Well, I suppose you could uh, argue it either way. Okay. But you'd have to buy me a beer to go into that. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, you don't know him that well. <laughs> so, so far, I got a beer from him and yeah. a print from Joyce Tennyson. This is good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it's a half baked theory, but I yeah. liked it a lot. And then, <laughs> uh, and then it, you know, uh, as most of us are interested in our, our own work, I thought, well, you know, basically, I play the blues, I play the minor pentatonic. I, I have a certain subject matter I like. Uh, I use use generally short depth of field. I tend to use an oblique angle rather than place your camera straight in front of something. I put it off to the side just a tad, and I tilt it just a tad, which breaks the perspective. Mm -hmm. That's a note. Uh, I like things to look a certain way when I print them. That's a certain note. Those are just conscious decisions. And uh, the, the point of that is a, 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 a lot of uh, our colleagues can spend years and not really think about uh, specific subject matter that's germane to their aesthetic or how they actually want it to look. Uh, they, they try all kinds of, we try all kinds of things. And I was just having fun with it. And so I thought, well, I'll just equate it with the 12 bar blues. Now, and, did you decide that this would be a good way to frame some of the lectures I give, or is this something that then went on to inform your photography as you went forward? It did both. Yeah. Uh, I, How so? uh, I teach in a university uh, in, in Texas. I live on the Texas Louisiana border, and I've been there 30 years, and I, I give that lecture to, mm -hmm. to students. Um, and most of the students are. Uh, are far more interested in music than they are in photography. Right, right, so right. Uh, it's a way to uh, maybe sometimes connect, but also it's the way I think. And I think you're only, you're only um, value uh, to your colleagues, to yourself, or to students if you're in that teaching world is to tell them the truth. Tell them the truth as, as you've experienced it uh, uh, and let them uh, follow their own bliss, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, but op just open up possibilities. So um, that's my theory on the 12 bar blues. Mm -hmm. What got you into taking pictures? Okay. Well, uh, um, my mom, which is a decidedly non Texas thing to tell you, but we were a single, <laughs> we were a single parent uh, household for most of my um uh, adolescence in my teen years, and my mom was a photographer oh. in a small town. And uh, uh, some of my earliest memories are uh, standing on a stool in the kitchen with an orange light. That'd be a safe light in the dark room. It was, she'd turn our kitchen into a dark room, and my sister and I would stand there and rock trays. And so I grew up around it. And then uh, it was just as I was entering college and not having a, a real focus, like, like a lot of people, um, that I. Um, barter camera. Mm -hmm. you know, I hadn't paid too much attention. That's just something my mom did. And then she said, I, sh I did some photographs of some guys fishing down on the river, had them processed, took them to her, and uh, showed them. And she said, and I think I was 19 at that point, she said, uh, well, honey, you have a nice sense of light. You have a good eye. And I thought, I do? And I thought, well, that's great. I have a good sense of light, a good eye. And I never looked back. Mm. So it's not an extraordinarily explosive story. It's just the truth. Good we always, I always like hearing, I mean, it, it comes up time and time again in our interviews, the, the relationship 
to photography and the and the parents. Yeah, I mean, in this yeah. case, the mother, often the father, even grandfathers. But just that, I love to hear that. I love to hear how that. that yeah. your mom where used that's born. Yeah, your mom used a phrase that I'd never heard. It was kind of saying you have a got a, you have a good eye. That's good common. Eye. Yeah. Just, you have a good sense of light. Mm. Yeah, and that that's the clue right there. Yeah, she. Was a photographer. She mm-hmm. was, and, and I think she uh, was a, 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 a closet artist. But like a lot of single parents, you know, her focus was to earn a living. Sure. And so she did a lot of portraits, and um, um, uh, she paid a lot of attention, a lot of attention to to the use of light and to the use of natural light. It wasn't uh, so much the artificial world. But she photographed a lot of children. She photographed them outside before it became so prevalent, and it was. Uh, it was would, interesting. Would you say your? I mean, I would say they do, but do you say your photos have humor? Mine? Yeah. Some of them. Uh, yeah. I like to think of them as sly humor, but uh, <laughs> other people would argue that that's not so sly. All right. But, uh, <laughs> and, and is that something that is conscious as you're developing that photo? And, and do my, you, my, yeah. my photographs consciously are I try to pay attention to the real world, and occasionally I'll construct things, but I generally work in the real world, and I look for those slightly awkward, askew moments where the world is completely ordinary, what you're looking at, yet it's completely mysterious mm-hmm. at the same time, mm-hmm. and it's a nebulous thing to, to talk about. I, ca- I can't really um, explain it any clearer to you. It's just, um, you just know it. Sometimes it's a gesture. Uh, sometimes it's a proximity of the context of what's in that frame. It's a number of things. Um, but m- my world or my life resides, you know, on the sort of outskirts of the bizarre art world rather than um, the commercial world. And there's a certain freedom to, to, to try and evolve uh, both projects and mm-hmm. to evolve uh, uh, your own sort of aesthetic, so to speak. And a lot of my influences came from literature, Oh, yeah. and, and folk art, mm-hmm. and, and uh, particularly uh, African-American Southern folk art, which mm-hmm. is just so visceral. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, it ain't always pretty, boys. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, from the literature, can you mention any of the, any of the writers that, uh, well, that come to mind? Well, I, I, I love William Butler Yeats, and mm-hmm. uh, I think of him often. Uh, I like uh, soft light. I use dark light a lot. And I think of his poem, uh, Had I the Embro- uh, Heaven's Embroidered Cloths, inwrought with golden and silver light, the blue, the dim, the dark cloth of night and light and the half light. I have it written on my darkroom wall. It sort of gives me a permission on occasion to use light that my colleagues would never use, you know, if you're formally trained. Mm-hmm. But I think spotty, diffuse, sharp, Foggy, you know, it's all good. All good. You know, it's all good. <laughs> I think we just found a title for this show. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, good title. Yeah, good title. <laughs> totally, totally. It's an observation. I don't, I don't even know how you could respond to this, but one of the things that uh, I picked up in the two days of being in this room is that you were sitting over in the corner doing portfolio reviews for a good deal of time. And I cannot tell you, we had a lot of photographers come through here, very good photographers, the best in the biz, some top names. And I cannot tell you how many people, like, as they come in and go, make sure you talk to Keith. He's the best photographer here. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I'm the only one who's got the Southern they accent. Want to the accent yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking. Seriously, no, no, you've no, been pre- very well recognized Well, here. I, I appreciate that. My, my colleagues are... Uh, I shall say, uncharacteristically kind. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, they say, what in the hell did you do there? <laughs> now, you're rep- represented by Howard Greenberg here in uh-huh, the city? Oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, okay. Well, he's the real deal. Yes, he is. And, you know, uh, he was a wonderful younger <laughs> photographer and, you know, is, has a huge reputation and one of the truly ethical people. Yes. And, you know, oh, well, that's a, yes. Sounds like a... A simple thing to say, but nowadays, well, any days, any time, that's a pretty, pretty big compliment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's truly like the, ethical. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the Holy Trinity. Yeah, right. ethical, <laughs> kind, good. <laughs> Here you go. Caring, knowing smart, and a little bit of money, and you're good mm-hmm. to go, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. also he, you know, he's not afraid to uh, resurrect um, some, some what I think are great photographers, uh, uh, who's often are, are deceased, that never really 
they were before their time, mm. like a person like William Gedney or, mm-hmm. um, uh, he, you know, he, he'll have shows for them mm. or, you know, Saul Leader and yeah. pe- people yeah, that yeah, yeah, were yeah. really in the trenches in the very, very beginning. And uh, a, a, a lot of galleries nationwide, um, you know, don't do that mm. necessarily. That's very true. very true. What's your feeling about the simplification of photography? You obviously have high respect for the art. And these days, everyone's yeah. got a phone and everyone's yeah. a, a quote-unquote photographer. It's, it's changed what photography is. How do you feel about that? Well, I think you can't really change that. And, you know, one process has always replaced another in the history sure. of photography, mm-hmm. which is only 179 years old. The, the irony is each one of these processes uh, that's been then been replaced has never really disappeared and there's probably more interest in historical alternative processes oh, yeah. than ever before I, I i personally think i think of the um great mythologist joseph gamble when he was confronted with a computer and he he said mm. well you ever taken one of those apart he says it's like angels dancing on the head of a pen it's just amazing and here's a man schooled in you know right. eons of uh cultural behavior and I, I think the same thing. I think it's kind of a miracle. I use the uh, iPhone for a lot of things. I just don't use it for my own serious, you know, uh, 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 sometimes overly serious work. But I, <laughs> I, I embrace it. I, I think the question is, you know, that to, nowadays you have 2.4 billion photographs uploaded right. a day. Mm-hmm. A day, And yeah. it's how do we consume those photographs? What do they mean culturally? You know, uh, all those those big questions. And with students, um, you know, in some respects, it dumbs down photography, uh, which in part is what this conference is about. You mm-hmm, know, to, mm-hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, ironically, it opens up untold possibilities. But as I said earlier, um, when I work with students, um, I'm, I'm always um, kind of wonderfully amazed that if they're properly introduced to a subject, you know, they get really interested in something besides the iPhone. And that's, I think of it as a tool, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And a useful tool. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Let me ask you a qu- Other than mm-hmm. your mom giving you some support early mm-hmm. on, can you look back to uh, when you felt the support of somebody who said, you know what, keep doing what you're doing. This may not be oh, yeah. the way to get, you yeah. know, your, your photos on the, the cover of uh, Time magazine or, or what, whatever publication or some advertisers, but, but keep doing what you're doing. And, and when you felt like you had that, that inner confidence to kind of just keep going forward. And, yes. You know, yes. Yeah. Uh, to, to answer your question, it's uh, he's 89 years old now, uh, still living in my town. There's a sculptor named David Cargill. And he would always, he had a, a, an interest in photography and, he was friends with my mother, and he, so he took an interest in my own early up, uh, you know, efforts. And he would crop my pictures, and and he would say things like, "Well, you know, you know, don't always just look at look at photographs like a photographer. Think about like a sculpture. Uh, think about how it would look from behind. You know, you know, do all all these kinds of things, and be ruthless with space. If it doesn't balance something in your picture, uh, or give." important information get it out of there be ruthless with space so I had I had people like that but I, I always thought and this isn't self-serving but I always thought I live in an out of the way, way place you know there's no huge museums there's no huge infrastructure um, and I would probably if I could get the joy out of doing the work You're that succeeding. was, that was right. going to be a big success That's it. the fact that um Things have turned out much, much better than I ever dreamed. Um, is is kind of amazing to me. Um, but still, in the art world, and what makes the art world work in the world of photography, uh, uh, I'm a relative outsider yeah. because you're not in the main right. stream where all this right. stuff happens. And did you feel pressure to get to, to pull yourself no, into I, that I, world no, and, I, and I change never, the style? No, I d- never did. But I think it's a good question. I always thought that. Uh, I was like a raggedy ass aristocrat mm-hmm. because uh, where I lived was muddy, full of folklore. Uh, you had 14 of the 20 uh, poisonous subspecies of snakes <laughs> in North America living in my community. Right. <laughs> Four out of the five carnivorous plants. <laughs> 
a and, miracle you're even here. And <laughs> alligators <laughs> two blocks away. And I'd never leave my house. <laughs> <laughs> no, think about it, though. And you have white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. You have African-American imagination. You have Cajuns, rednecks, yeah. Peckerwoods. You got... What, what, what was that last one? Peckerwoods. Peckerwoods. Okay, I'll look that up later. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I always thought it was a heady, heady mixture, and you had this uh, gumbo culture of, of uh, music. Uh, Great music. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. You know, religious affiliations, really strange stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, m- you guys don't remember, but the mullet haircut, <laughs> that comes from our town. <laughs> <laughs> it's still rocking in a little bit. So, uh, so I thought I was a redneck well, how, how aristocrat. About, how about, <laughs> you, you brought up religion, and does, does, that, does that Southern blend of religions inform your work at all, or did you I grow think, up with some of that? I yeah. think so. Yeah. You know, uh, to tell you the truth, this is kind of a uh, ridiculous thing to say, but occasionally I think, you know, if, if I could make a picture... Um, or a body of work that resonated like some of those great old hymns. Mm. And I'm not particularly religious, but softly and tenderly, or how great they are, or some of those great things. Even a non-religious person such as myself, when I hear somebody singing that, it still gets to me. Oh, sure. It just gets to me, uh, and it's supposed to. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't particularly want to lose that uh, um, feeling, so to speak. Uh, and that's not an art school or graduate school treatise. <laughs> no, that's, that's, just, that's, that's human just, nature. That's, that's being a person. Yeah, 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 yeah which yeah. I think is important. So that's the answer to the question. <laughs> being uh, a, por- a person's pretty important to being a photographer. Yeah, you know, <laughs> unless you're a, unless you're a turtle, then it yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> so we, we, we've been asking this question, of, uh, and I almost hesitate to do it here, and I, but I'm going to ask anyway. <laughs> if you had to throw out all your photos, except for one, can you do that? Could you tell us one photo you keep? Um, well, off the top of my head, I'd probably keep the one that um, probably began my um, career, which is a photograph called Fireflies, uh, yeah. which was a, actually a total mistake. But uh-huh. it, it's, it's basically <laughs> a, a square photograph, black and white, uh-huh. take, made photograph. at the end of the day. And it's two little guys in shorts and big Wellington boots standing in a swamp holding a jar of fireflies with a magnolia tree. Uh, which is basically the only thing in focus. They blurred perfectly. Yeah, two kids, and yeah. It, you know, and the blur. Uh, I didn't see it. I was so disappointed in the beginning when I, when I uh, developed the film. I was excited about it, but I didn't expect him to be so out of focus. Mm-hmm. And it, I showed him to my wife, uh, who was uh, at least a hundred times smarter than I was, mm-hmm. and she said, "Oh, honey, you ought to go print that and see what it looks like." So I went and printed it, and I showed it to her, and she said, "You ought to go print that bigger." Mm-hmm. And then she came out of the dark room, and we printed it again, and and um, it was through her eyes I thought, "This isn't at all what I intended, but this is so much better." Wow! Something had creeped in. So to answer your question, I'd probably Just keep that one. Keep that one. Well, that that gets me to this. This question is intent. You know what you expect and what you get. How you, how I guess as an artist, we we grow from from our mistakes. We we and 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 the differences between what you expect you're going to get and what you do get, and and how you can value that. You know, because a lot of people, as we were speaking about earlier, what is your favorite photo? Well, it's because what I I worked so hard to get that photo, and I got it. Mm-hmm. You know, even if it's not such a great photo, great you know? story, so, lousy picture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I'm just kind of. This idea of being able to re- reevaluate your own work or, or maybe through someone else's eyes it makes a big yeah, difference. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, I'm reading a, a wonderful book I, I bought at the Metropolitan Museum a couple of days ago, and it's essentially photographers talking about photographs that they missed mm. or, did, mm-hmm. or didn't take. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, I'm going to use that with students. Yeah, you yeah know? it's a good topic. Uh, yeah. there's, there's, it's a good topic. It makes you think about perspective, mm-hmm. uh, subject matter, and why you miss things or or why you didn't do it in the first place. Yeah. And now when you're in New York, is that what you do, go to museums? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, my gosh. Catch up with stuff. Well, I like shallow things like, you know, going to Barney's sure. and, and stuff like that. But, right. uh, man, and this is not a, uh original idea, but if I lived here, mm-hmm. I'd go to the Metropolitan Museum every single <laughs> Sunday I was alive. Mm. Let's get know? there early. That's yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, but... Yeah. Uh, you talk about, f- you know, and MoMA, I mean, yeah, but, yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, or the uh, Pierpont Morgan, yeah. you know. I mean, That's a great museum. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. You know, I think more if more of us did that on occasion, we'd be kinder, gentler, 
mm-hmm. animals. We'd be a little more erudite. Uh, and we'd certainly see multiple meanings in things we just pass by. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what great art does for you. Yeah. And, yeah. and you got it. My God. In this city, one you advantage. got it. That's one advantage. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Keith Quarter, absolute blast talking to you. Thank you, so much. Uh, thank you for joining us. Well, my and pleasure. If Douglas Kirkland did nothing but photograph Marilyn Monroe for Look Magazine's 25th anniversary edition, we would probably still be talking about him today, but that shoot is just the tip of an incredible iceberg that includes portraits of Man Ray, Mick Jagger, Marlene Dietrich, Michael Jackson, and just about every celebrity in between. Kirkland's portrait of Charlie Chaplin is at the National Portrait Gallery in London. He shot assignments on over 150 motion picture sets, including 2001 A Space Odyssey, Titanic, and he took the iconic shot of John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever. Kirkland's list of accomplishments is far too long to go into here, but I have no doubt he still treasures the day I personally assisted him when he shot what would be the very last cover of Look magazine back in 1971. Okay, we are back at Depth of Field, and this particular interview we're about to have is is interesting to me and special to me. Uh, Back in 1970, 1971, excuse me, uh, I was a senior at the School of Visual Arts, and a job came up at Look Magazine, washing and drying prints in the lab. And I ran down there and was interviewed by Arthur Rothstein, who I had no idea who he was at the time, shame on me, uh, and I was hired. And I left school actually three weeks early to start my career in photography, washing and drying prints in a darkroom at a magazine. And I got to know people, and uh, uh, they were starting to trust me and give me a little more responsibilities. And one day they said that, uh, we have a photographer, uh, Douglas Kirkland, who's going to be photographing a cover for us, and we'd like you to assist him. And I got together with Douglas at his studio in New York, and we photographed what would turn out to be the very last cover of Look magazine. And I have that magazine right here, uh, and I'm with Doug Kirkland. And 47 years ago, I met this man, and here I am sitting here at the other end of my career. And (laughs) comment. I'm certain it's not the other end of your career, and it's the beginning. Oh, I like, I love this. Okay. This is (laughs) always a fresh beginning. (laughs) It's, It's always a fresh beginning. Talking about fresh beginnings. So you've been taking pictures now for over six decades. How do you stay excited after all these years? What gets you juiced at this point in the game where you say, I really like taking pictures. I still like doing this. It's, uh, it's, it's very special and it's very deep in, my, in me. It's who Douglas Kirkland is. And that is his father liked taking pictures although he was a tailor he was not in the picture business but uh he uh, had different cameras at our house in in canada where i grew up and um not too far from niagara falls new york uh-huh. and i worked i got a job at the local studio after school and on saturdays and I did everything from just putting prints on the dryer to whatever it needed to be done because it, that was the beginning of my genuine, deep interest in photography. And it remains to this day, and I'm 83, going on 84 next year. And I'm not going to stop. I love it. It's, it's who Douglas Kirkland really is, and it's who he became. And I'm not going to walk away from that. And I've had I've had very good fortune in with numerous people. The Canon people have been very good to me, and their products have been very good. You're an explorer and, of light. It's worth mentioning. Yes. I think you were one of the original explorers of light. Is that correct? I was in the first year. Yeah. Uh, I was asked. And that was more than 25 years ago. And I'm, you've been with Canon ever since. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to, to my, the day my eye, eyelids close, I'm going to continue to use <laughs> Canons. Oh, now, wow. you've, you've seen the transition from film, I mean, really the nuts and bolts film, to full tilt digital. Were you apprehensive at first? You know, what were your feelings when digital first started coming around? And, and uh, I know that you're totally digital now, or are you? Oh, I'm totally digital now. 
Do you keep your cameras? Like, do you have a collection going back uh, many years of the cameras you use over the years? Yes, I do keep them, and uh, I have many. Uh, there's a couple things I wanted to mention. First of all, you mentioned your father, and we interview a lot of people on the show, and it, it never, I guess it always surprises me how many people mention their father, yeah. mostly fathers, sometimes mothers, but mostly their father, who was a part-time photographer, an amateur Somehow photographer. Somehow associated Somehow with the camera photography, it yes. it puts it into somebody, and it, it, it makes me just wonder how people reflect on that as as they continue in their career and how do you think back to your father as a, oh, all the time uh, as a photographer do you, I, do you kind of tribute things to him I mean you mentioned him you right know, away some, one thing uh, my dad did before I was born he had a, a folding camera a little 127 folding camera and I have I have that camera still to this wow. day <laughs> that's beautiful and uh, it was in the the Great Depression years, and his dad and my father uh, took him to Western Canada, and they made pictures with that 127 camera, and uh, we still have those pictures, and I still have that camera, but it's all photography, and it's where I got excited, and then I worked at the local photo studio in Fort Erie, photographing weddings and babies and anything they would let me photograph. Let me ask you about a uh, an address and see if it rings a bell. 80 West 40th Street? Absolutely. Okay. Alan was talking about the beginning of his career. What about uh, that address for you? What's that mean? 80 West 40th was where I worked for Irving Penn. Hmm. And he was a great influence on me. And he formed part of who Douglas Kirkland is to this day. And I have, there's a recent book that came out by him that's uh, from him, or, uh, of his world, and uh, it's a thick book, and I have that at home as a, at the top of my stack. Because, and I have a picture of Penn on the wall. Mm. And uh, What was he shooting at that time? I mean, his career obviously has many phases, and he's done many things. What were you working with him at that stage? Well, he worked with... Uh, he was a Hasselblad, was but he, he also had, uh, I think he had no different Well, cameras. not the cameras much, but was he shoot, was his fashion work, or was it the oh, still yes. lives, or... He, he, he would do anything, and that was why Penn was so incredible, because mm -hmm. he wasn't, he didn't want to stay still, and he, he was a great inspiration to me, because that's what led to Douglas Kirkham becoming who he is and has become and uh, you can do anything if you these hands can mold anything and with a camera and that's what's so spectacular what are you looking forward to shooting that what do you have any assignments that you want to do any topics you want to cover that you haven't or you want to pursue more well i'm going to europe in in about a month to uh, um, photograph something on the, the beaches of Normandy. Uh -huh. And uh, I had a, have a friend who is in his 90s now who was in the invasion of Normandy. Now, when you go to Normandy, is this going to be a self-assignment? Are you just going with an open mind? Do you have specific images you're trying to get? Or are you just going to be open to whatever comes before you? I've been in Normandy, but uh, to go and be with the youngest man who was part of the invasion force and was uh, there, and he's still around to this day, I'm going to be there, and our son is going to be there, Mark Kirkland, who's become an, uh, an anime, became an animator and has been with The Simpsons for oh. <laughs> for 28 years now. That's a good gig, yeah. Yeah, he's a very, he's a very, uh, Mark Kirkland. And so it's, the Kirklands go on, what am I to say? That's great. Who was the most challenging person you photographed? Because you photographed a lot of personalities. I imagine there were a couple of real doozies you had. Who, who, who gave you the biggest fight that you walked away and said, I got the shot? I never have, and I, I don't feel I've ever had a, a great fight, 
because I've won them all. Ah. And uh, frankly, photography is, is my friend, and it's who I am. And that's, photography will always mean that to me. Can we speak a little bit about uh, working on movie sets? I know that you've shot on sets for some of the some pretty incredible movies over the years. Um, when you're there, do you kind of disappear next to the boom operator or do you kind of take over and, and do setup shots? And what's your experience in working with Kubrick on, and others? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Stanley Kubrick was a wonderful man and he had been on a Look magazine photographer. Yes, that's right, yeah. From the Bronx, yeah. And uh, he welcomed me to 2000, uh, I guess that yeah. was. Yeah. 2000, it was his film at that time. And uh, he welcomed me and uh, made me comfortable and uh, he was glad I was there and uh, it, uh, he, he was a, a revelation to me because, and his, another person was Jim Cameron. Mm -hmm. and Titanic. He, yeah. Titanic. Yeah. Yeah. And I did a book on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they're both perfectionists. Uh, yeah, they're, they're brilliant perfectionists. And uh, Jim is still around. Uh, unfortunately, Stanley is not. And I, I was very close with him, and, and uh, all these people are inspirations. This, that's who I would like to be. I don't want to take their place, but I, they are an inspiration. And when you think of a, the perfect picture, what would that be? And it depends on the subject and understanding who they are and what they represent. And that's where great photography comes from. And uh, that explains many things that words can do on some occasions, but only a brilliant picture can frequently uh, do on, on others. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about um, perhaps working with what we've, you know, we, we call famous people or, or actors, and if you're, if you're on set, and, and compared to working with uh, a regular person, do you, do you, uh, and, and I, I, these are phrases that I, <laughs> I hesitate to use, but do you approach them differently or once the doors are closed, is, is everything kind of on equal footing and, and when you try to get reactions, expressions, emotions out of people, do you approach them in different ways? Honestly, the bottom line is whomever you are with, uh, as you speak with me, you show sincerity. And that's what I do with the camera as well. Show sincerity and a desire to get it right and get it right in the camera. And I want them to feel their time is worthwhile with, with Douglas Kirkland. I uh, just wanted to throw one thing out. We were talking about movies. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the famous photograph of John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever that became the bedroom poster of every kid who grew up in the seventies. <laughs> That's your photo, am I correct? Yes, okay. It is. <laughs> <That's Fortunately>. <laughs> now, if, let's you know. You talked about Penn in the perhaps in the fifties. We're talking Travolta in the seventies and Kubrick. Would you is would you say there's a golden age? Was there a That's golden a age for photography? Yeah. Is there a golden age? I mean, we had you know the movie Blow Up and you know the sixties and the fashion in London. Looking back, would you say there was a golden era for you? The golden era is what you make it, and mm -hmm. you find it, and you discover it, and you make the most out of it. Douglas, uh, you are a gentleman and a legend. I can't find well, thank you. any words that better describe you. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I'm very moved by the fact you wanted to hear my words, and it's, it's from my heart and soul. Thank you so much. Douglas Kirkland. Thank you, sir. You know, personally speaking, I've had a lot of really wonderful moments doing this show, but seeing Doug Kirkland again and sitting and chatting with him is just absolutely a wonderful, wonderful experience. We're going to take a short break and return with a segment of our conversation with Joyce Tennyson from the 2018 Optic Conference hosted by b &H. 
We hope you're enjoying this edition of the BH Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Joyce Tennyson has photographed magazine covers for Time, Life, Newsweek, Premier, Esquire, and the New York Times Magazine, and she's well recognized for her distinctive style of fine art photography. Her large format Polaroid and silver gelatin portraits, often of women, have been lauded the world over, and her book, Wise Women, was the best-selling photography book of 2002. Enigmatic, timeless, sensuous, and haunting are just some of the words used to describe her work. But like so many greats, her humility, insight, and willingness to experiment are what we found so appealing. With Joyce, we spoke mostly of her recent work photographing landscapes and trees and her use of gold leaf in her prints. Join us as we speak with Joyce. You've worked on 16 books, which means at least 16 projects you've had. Are you clear when a project is finished? Because I know I've worked on various projects over time. And sometimes I'm very clear, this is it. I just took the last picture. It feels okay. And sometimes I'm never really quite sure. What's your experience of that? For me, it's absolutely clear. When I finish a project, I just, I intuitively know it. And it's, it, in a way, it's a relief because yeah. I work really hard, as we all do when we're, you know, and I give myself a year to two years for a project max. And so I drive myself um, to do the, to, to finish the work like that. Mm -hmm. And I really, uh, when the project, be, well, there's two parts of when the project is over, as you know. It's when the shooting of the project is over. Right. Hopefully in a year, maybe. And then the next year, it's the editing and it's deciding, you know, what is the book going to look like and working on all of that and then getting the shows booked around the, uh, to exhibit them in different yeah. cities. And then the part I like the least, which is helping to market it. But that's the cycle, sure. you know? So the, I think that's what a lot of younger photographers don't realize is that the shooting is only one part of it. You know, that is the, in general, the easy, fun, creative part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in order to be successful, you have to, continue and see that whole project through but then when that's done you are really you're really free to start something new do you find yourself during that year of editing and all this other stuff the post shooting mm -hmm. part of it are you still taking pictures or do you back away from your camera a lot at that point well I'll, i always think well maybe another great picture will come up mm -hmm. And I can throw it in at the last minute. But uh, I, I might do fun shooting, but I only do my serious shooting when it's, I can see the project. Okay. And I usually start off with the cover. It's interesting. I, 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 and I will challenge myself by mocking up a cover, like, you know, transformations, for example, and I have a cover image there, or for wise women, and I put it over my work desk. And it may not be the cover in the end, but it has the title and the picture, and there's something about it. You establish a framework and a starting point. A starting point, and I know, because I'm extremely disciplined, that I will finish that project. And seeing it every day, it's like it's, it's, like it's sure. already ha it's happening. It makes it real. It makes it real, and then I'm so thrilled when it's on press, and I've gone on press with most of my books. It's very scary because, you know, the, the presses go for 24 hours for depending how big the print run, you know, is going to be, but mine have always been at least 10,000 for a print re run and Wise Women multiple, you know, reprints on it, but... And then it dries back and it doesn't look exactly the way right. it looked mm -hmm. when at midnight when you were signing <laughs> those sheets. I've been there. I know that. You yes. know that, right? Yes. And then, <laughs> but when that book is out and, and it's in the stores and it is, you know, hopefully there's a show of it that's up, you know, in the, in the next months or whatever, I feel like. Yeah. Um, you know, it's this wonderful feeling. Also frightening because then you think, what if I never 
doing get inspired again, and <laughs> yeah. you do have that feeling. Sure. And I've talked to a lot of other, you know, photographers, and they have the same feeling because, mm. you know, let's face it, mm-hmm. you can't will something that's really creative, creative into yeah. existence. Yeah. You yeah. can, you could choose some project that's kind of, you know, more of a of, of an easy kind of mm-hmm. thing, but. To do something really new is right. is, is quite a. Hmm. And what for you is the, is the final, the final product of a photo always the print? Yes, I love printing. Mm-hmm. I I have you know I have a wonderful two thousand square foot studio, mm-hmm. and uh, you know I've always been lucky in having smart young assistants, um, and I love my assistants. I. I mean, they become like part of the family and we stay friendly Mm -hmm. for the rest of our lives. And I like them to stay for at least three to five years. And then, of course, they want to have their own career. But honestly... Selfish. Yes, (laughs) yes, yes, yeah. And I do what I, I can to help them launch them into that. But I feel so sad when when someone i've been working with because th- it's not like a professional relationship right. you're sitting right next oh, to yeah. them right, right, right. and you're sharing, sharing their right. you're sharing and you know they're having boyfriend troubles and i have somebody who just died in my family or whatever you know it, it's so complex and and uh, do you find that many of your assistants end up emulating you or attempt to and if they do do you just do you like discourage them to go find your own eyes. Good question. Some of my <laughs> former students try to emulate me uh-huh. or whatever, but my assistants don't because they know that what I really think is important for for any creative person is to find their own voice. Sure. And that ultimately that makes you the most happy and probably the most successful because I think copying somebody just never really lasts that long. Mm-hmm. It has to come from inside your own your own self. Yeah. Can we discuss a little bit about some of the technique for the tree photos and how you get the look that, that you've achieved? Yes. Uh, when I moved to Maine, it was such a departure and such a new uh, chapter in my life that uh, when I started photographing the trees in the fog, I I was really enlivened and I, I I loved going out in the early morning and I really felt like it, it was like some kind of magic. I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing in front of my lens. Mm. But, and I could see it as, as a series and I could see what I wanted it to be is a show that when people walked in that they were somehow touched. Mm. And So you were thinking of it at that point as an as, exhibit because you exhibit. people to come into it. Yeah, yeah. Because they do, they they do create some kind of a uh, atmosphere in the same way that as I, I was photographing them in the fog, if, and I'm sure you've mm-hmm. all been out there, mm-hmm. it is a magical atmosphere, oh, isn't yeah. it? It oh, really yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. And so I wanted to communicate that in this exhibit, which uh, I could see in my mind, and so then I had to figure out, well, how do I want to print them? And because I think for any for art, the form, the content, and the ultimate way of uh, expressing it, the, for a photographer, the way you print it, is it going to be black and white? Is it going to be color? Is it going to be on what kind of paper? How big? How whatever? And uh, I had taught uh, alternative process mm-hmm. when I first started teaching photography. And so I was aware of all the, the options. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so I kept trying to think of how am I going to print these uh, the, these tree photos. And I had taken a trip to Peru um, right before I started photographing the trees. And I was so impressed by the way the Incan culture had made gold sculptures um, and artwork uh, to speak to the gods. And they felt that gold, because it was some kind of an alchemical process that they didn't really understand, had a special ability to be able to transcend our, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. small universe and speak directly to the gods. 
And so as I was thinking about the trees, I was like, well, gosh, I, I've always been trying to th- speak to the gods. I'm teasing yeah. a bit. But, you know, <laughs> sure. I've always wanted my work to have a transcendent edge to it. And so I thought, well, what if these were gold? And so I, t- I spent a year teaching myself how to do gold leaf. Uh-huh. And it really, you know, I made so many mistakes and I threw so many things away and I got frustrated. But there is a part of me that it is in very disciplined and I don't take no for an answer mm-hmm. easily. Um, and I did get a process that, that worked for me and I did a show of, of the uh, trees on gold, mm-hmm. on gold leaf. Mm-hmm. And it did create that feeling that I had seen in my head. Mm. And a lot of men in particular came up to me afterwards and I felt particularly, you know, warmed by that, saying that they they had tears behind their eyes. There was something about that walking through the gallery that they felt very touched by mm-hmm. it and and they loved it. Mm-hmm. And some of them wanted to have one, right. to, you know. Right. And which is even nicer. Which was <laughs> That's a e- beautiful it's even, thing. It's yes. A, how, how big were the prints? I mean, I'm sure there are different sizes, but they generally? Were, they were 30 by 40. 30 by 40, okay. Yeah. yeah. To make these prints on, on the gold leaf, what considerations uh, did you have to make or what did you have to learn that distinguished from the, the previous printing you had Well, I had done? to learn how to put the gold down, and yeah. then I had to learn how to print on some kind of a transparent medium. Okay. Or like Japanese Kozo paper, which uh-huh. I, I tried too, and to get that gold to come through the the print, and right. then I had to learn learn how to preserve it and what kind of varnishes to mm-hmm. put on so that it seals it's, the uh, yeah. the image. Gold leaf is the strangest material. It's it is very weird. Yeah. It is a weird material and very hard to tame. Yeah, and so. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I, 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 it did take a, over a year to yeah. figure out how to even be successful on a, a really small image. And then once I got that going, I, I was able to get them bigger. And then I, I started to get a re, uh, an allergic reaction to some of the varnish I was oh, using. Because uh, oh, years of being in the dark early room. on the dark room and, and exposed to a lot of the chemistry... Um, it turns you hypersensitive it, in it, some ways. It, yeah, that's a lot what of people get bad yeah. allergies. So now what I do is that I'll make a small image and scan it, and then um, I can then have a digital file and I can have them printed on metal. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And but I also have the large Canon printers, and they have a metal paper, which I found a year ago which is 44 by whatever. Mm -hmm. And so the prints that I showed in Norway last month were all, you know, 44 by 60 inches. Huge. And they created their own kind of energy field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I just had them up with, uh, you know, magnets. So they weren't framed in glass and they were so present. And that was a great experience to bring them to another country where they had not seen the gold trees and and the metal paper actually translated that and the size they were almost tree like yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah i imagine mm-hmm. the size would be important in, it was in very the scale is yeah. a huge scale. element yeah. of that sure yeah. Yeah. so that was a uh, so within the printing of the the gold trees i started off with the gold leaf and now i'm using the the metallic paper, and each of them is different. And honestly, I don't know which one I like better. It's it's just a process. Yeah. Two different versions, Two variations. Vi- yeah, and, and having a very different. Uh, uh, I I think people respond to them differently. Mm-hmm. I think the gold leaf was it was more precious, and they people were touched by wanting to know how they were done. Whereas mm-hmm. the large metallic. Uh, pieces. I think people were they kind of boomeranged mm. off. They were mm-hmm. they were so big. Yeah. And, not not know. that this is really part of the heart of this conversation, but did you see a difference in in sales? Did did people respond to one more than the other necessarily, or or is that something you didn't even factor in? I mean, you know, I never thought. I never think about 
sales when I'm doing. No, of I don't think no, anyone I didn't, I didn't does. Think that right. way. You're yeah. just hoping that yeah. they're I'm good. I'm just kind of curious. I'm yeah. just hoping that they're they're <laughs> they're received. interesting yeah. and that they speak to other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and honestly, both of those processes seem to have their own audience right. and right. call to different kinds of people. And are you uh, speaking of the cycles of projects and mm-hmm. where you are? Um, where are you right now? Do you have a... Well, in the s- lecture right? that I just uh, uh-huh. gave here, uh, you know, I ended it with a new series I've just started on clouds. Uh-huh. And if you had yeah. told me 10 years ago I'd do a cloud <laughs> series, I'd say, you're crazy. <laughs> um, but, of course, I've been photographing them forever. Is I mean, don't you? Sure. I mean, yeah. every Somewhere time I teach in Santa Fe and I look up, you know, the clouds are so amazing. But every state has a different... wherever. But I'd never... I'd always admired the Stieglitz equivalents, Mm -hmm. you know, that series that's so much a part of art history and that is housed at the National Gallery. But, you know, I just thought, well, I I don't want to compete with Stieglitz or whatever, but I'm now doing them with the gold. Mm. And Mm. so it just progressed naturally. Uh, I just started, I thought, I, I had so many cloud pictures, but also in Maine, um, I, you know, I look out on, uh, Rockport Harbor and keep when, rubbing it in. Go ahead. Yeah. Keep rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> the, clo- the clouds from morning to night oh, are yeah. changing all the time. And it's they, what they say about Maine is if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So that's also about the clouds. I mean, they're just changing. And so, I I started seeing them like people, mm-hmm. and sort of in the mo- yeah. same way that that I love people and people's relationships. The, the trees kind of became my my people for mm-hmm. a while, and now the clouds. Mm-hmm. I'm just waiting to see what new people I'm going to meet are, every are, day. Now, are the trees getting a little jealous, and are, <laughs> are, are, are you just decided I'm done with you guys for now, or do you do you ever know go back to the woods and? <laughs> that's right. I don't know. You know, I yeah. I once that show and book is out it, it really does seem to it's put over. closure yeah that's um, interesting. Mm. yeah i understand that yeah. and uh so and, and who knows uh i do have some i keep a notebook all the time and i'm a journal writer and and so i i, I have a notebook that's just for new ideas and the whole time that I've been in New York the past week, I, I, you know, I've practically filled a notebook with yeah. new ideas that just boomeranging off mm. of different stimulus from being here. I was at the Metropolitan and I saw the Heavenly Body show, mm-hmm. which, is, you know, was amazing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, that, you know, you can't help but be in new places yeah. and have it affect you and... I started thinking back on my past uh, when I looked at the Heavenly Bodies uh, show because that was a show that was uh, about designers, mm-hmm. and but designers, uh, pretty much I believe, all of whom were brought up Catholics. Catholics yeah. mm-hmm. Well, I was too, and I've been, you know, I, I left immediately when I was 17, you know, and had, <laughs> now I would be called, uh, it would call myself a Buddhist or something. Uh-huh. But I, I, so I felt so distant from that. But when I went to that show, I felt, oh my God, this is, this is me. Mm-hmm. Or it, there, I could see, you know, with all of us, <laughs> whoever we were brought up as the psychologists are right, you know, yeah. It's this a lot that's established <laughs> at a you very can't shake it. Yeah. you yeah, can't yeah, shake yeah, it. Yeah. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so yeah. I felt really happy about that. And I the only thing I felt irritated at myself is that I didn't let that show more. Because I always was like, No, I, I I'm a, a neutral figure. I'm you know, I'm a Buddhist. I or a uh and uh but I, I really admired those designers for letting that that inner territory that had affected them really mm-hmm. come out. Let and out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I recognized a lot of my early self in that. I did. Interesting. Yeah. Can I ask one question we've been asking? Uh, is that okay? Yeah, I, sure. Go for we've it. We've been asking <laughs> all the photographers this kind of <laughs> cheesy question, but it, it's been getting some good responses. So um, if, if you had to throw away every single one of your photos except for one, could you say which one it would be? 
There are a couple, but I, I, I think it would be the image of uh, Suzanne in the chair that uh, has been published a lot. Uh, and she's sitting half nude or wrapped in fabric in a chair and looking back at the camera. Mm, I th- yeah, okay. I think I know which one that is. And yeah. the one that you have on this uh, sheet that you printed out, Suzanne, also in Contortion, which was uh, the cover I love that of Transformations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one would be, in from my book, Light um, Warriors, the picture of Dasha with the two doves on her shoulders. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That has, yeah. Yeah. Th- th- those... Those come to mind right and, away. And would you? Why would you say those necessarily? And maybe there's not a simple answer, but just. Uh, I I think that they. I have had so much feedback from people from different countries because, of course, now with email and mm-hmm. and all of that, that the response to to those three pictures in particular has been never ending, mm. and, and in a positive way, mm. and somehow speaks to people in different countries so there's got to be some kind of universal right. energy that's that, that a few photographers have when, when we asked this question they, they they referred to what happened when they took that photo so there was a memory um others because it seemed to define them it sounds like these it's they're what the photos are giving back to you like they're out there in the world people respond and then what's coming back to you is something that's important. I think long term that that is a wonderful part of of being part of this new global community. I know that Wise Women is the book that I've had the most response from from people around the world, and maybe be, it's because it came out, you know, when social media was was mm-hmm. already very present. But it tends to be a book that that is given to women. Uh, who might be going, well, often it's a birthday present or something, but many of whom are, are not well, like are, are suffering from cancer. And I will get uh, emails from them saying, thank you so much for doing Wise Women. I got it as a gift and I, you know, just was operated on for de- breast cancer or whatever it is. And having that book near me has made me feel so much better. Mm-hmm. And now I, when I did important. that book, I never... Th- thought that that would ever happen. Yeah. I just was doing it to try to understand who I would be in 10, 15, 20 years, mm-hmm. you know. And mm-hmm. so th- th- that, is, uh, that is a wonderful part of my life, I think, is that uh, relationship that has been built thanks to, you know, social mm-hmm. yeah. media, particularly email, because right. it is a global community now and books do travel. Um, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. are given us gifts, and mm-hmm. and uh, so that that is a that is a wonderful circle, isn't it? So to, to maybe as a final question, um, mm-hmm. y- when you went to do Wise Women, your your it was part of the process was to maybe find out who you would be and who are you? I mean, absolutely, and all of my uh, books have had that organic kind of beginning. Uh, of of really self probing but at something about who i was at that point in my life um and and mining that territory mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. um when i got to the age of worrying about who i'd be mm-hmm. when so the <laughs> words like gone to seed or over the hill might <laughs> have been used in Former generations, course, not now. Right, no one right, would dare say right, that now. Yeah. But 60's the new 20. Right? That's right. <laughs> that's right. 60's the new 20. Uh, but uh, so organically, when my uh, my show opened, uh, my Light Warriors show opened, that uh, my assistant said to me, so what are we going to do next? I just, without even thinking, and it, I was kind of jolted, and I said, well, let's go to 100. There you go. Because why not? Mm-hmm. Well, it just came it's out of my mouth, yeah. Yeah. and it, and then I thought, oh God, I don't want to do another book. I'm so tired, <laughs> and all of that. And then I thought, I'll just do this little portfolio and see. Mm-hmm. And I showed it to a couple of my, because I uh, photo editor friends in in New York, and I just said, you know, what do you think? Do you think this has legs? Do you think people would be interested? And they were like, oh, Joyce, this, I think you're hit on something. Mm. So, took a big deep yeah. breath and said, okay. Yeah. 
and I lay out, uh, you know, when I have a project, I lay it out, um, and it's how long am I going to have to do this? And I have a big calendar, and it's month by month. Mm -hmm. Where do I have to be at the end of each month? Oh, wow. And really? that's, yeah, wow. so interesting. I had to be in those 10 cities within that year and how to how to fund that because, yeah. you know, obviously, I've, 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 you know, I... I, I teach, I have exhibits, I have books, mm -hmm. et cetera. But um, to do what I try with the, uh, with the book is to keep the expenses down. So when I did, uh, because it is self-funded, even yeah, though yeah. from when you know I was with Time Warner Publishers and they did eight of my books, I would get an advance. But yeah. that, you know, that's, that's one month. Right. <laughs> right. And... So for Wise Women, I had so many students that I had stayed in touch with. And so each city, I stayed with a former student and mm -hmm. I traded them a print. Oh. And so that made it easy. And if you want to stay by my place, I, I, I'll take a print. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we know we have a spare bedroom. <laughs> yeah. And you live right in New York? Uh, no, no. But I'll drive you back and forth. All right. Okay. All right. It's, 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 it's 45 minutes we can back there, okay? It's a deal. Right. You stay in, for a night and I have right. a print, okay? Okay. Great. That's I, great. I live in New York. I'm going to take her. From you. All right, okay. <laughs> but what I found interesting is that you, um, uh, you know, even at that stage in your career, you wanted to take your still nascent idea to editors and, and bounce them off and see what you thought, because obviously, you know, you had enough of a track record and experience to say, I guess my point is, a, um, I give you a lot of credit, you know, and I also, for people listening you always have to ask around and, and see what people think and get feedback. And Yes, you know, yeah. yes. Yeah. And it's always so important to have a group of friends around whose opinion you trust. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and I always, when I start out for a project, I want some people that I trust to look at it. And because I want them, I really, I, I enjoy the feedback. Mm -hmm. I really do. And it, because sometimes I may be going down a, the wrong path. I mean, it's, for all of us, right? Wouldn't mm -hmm. you rather know it? Mm -hmm. Have you had people tell you you are going down the wrong path? I was just I mean, going to ask you that. Now, have you ever had a thing where people are going, eh, and then you saw it, you go, no, you're wrong. Um, uh, I have when I've been editing, for example, that uh, I always try to edit myself, mm -hmm. and then I will go to a graphic designer at the end. And uh, or I'll ask friends, too. I, I, we're editing, as you know, is a really – it's it, it can make or break a break a project, but I it's hard to after you've laid something out to have somebody come and say, "Oh gosh, that you know." I don't think it's that's, also the smartest thing you can do. It is because you cannot be objective about that. You can't. Some of the images are too personal. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and I, that that's something very very important. I think for for just a little sideline here. Um, a lot of photo. It took me a long time to, to understand that. Sometimes you get a picture and the big deal is that you actually able to get it. It may not be good, but it's got such a good story behind everything right. else. And that's all but, you can but, see. And that's it. And to you, it's amazing. And you put in your portfolio and you're showing it around. It's not a good picture. It's not, I've seen that It's a great many story, times. but no. And I think that is probably one of the hardest things for anybody in the arts to be able to get around. Look at it and say, okay, let's be honest now. Is it? Nah. No. no, no, and I think that's why a good editor is 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 so important because they will see it in a neutral way. I'm going to throw something else that my mentor Marty Pedersen, uh, publisher of Graphics, oh, right. told me. He was my he's mentor. A, he's a wonderful editor too. Yes, he is. Yes. And he told me something which never left me. And he goes that he said that you are going to be judged by the weakest picture in your portfolio. And that's what I look for. He goes, I see great photographs all the time. And when I see a new book, I look at all the good stuff and I go, okay, where's the weak one? Because that photograph shows what that person will consider good enough to turn in. So if they have 20 killers and there's a dog at the end, there's a very good chance I'm gonna get that dog when the person comes back from assignment because they're willing to show me that now. Oh, and I thought that was most, that's complex thinking. That mm -hmm. is, and that's from seeing a lot of portfolios. And he, and he says, "Oh, that, that proves it out for me." Hmm. Very I looked for that weak picture. That's the one I'm looking for. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh my! Interesting. Good takeaway. 
good tech away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can take away with that. Though. <laughs> we take it away. All right, uh, Joyce, it's been an absolute blast talking with you. We well, were, we were waiting blast. for this. Yeah. Good. I've yeah, had a totally blast. Totally. Yeah, totally. yeah no, you, you guys so are great. Well, um, Thank you. Yeah. Well, any exhibits we can tell our listeners to look for, or yes, where well, they can find your books, etc. Absolutely. Et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Well, Amazon has them all. Okay, and uh, if you're if you're coming to Mid Coast Maine, I have. Uh, a, a show opening on July 6th. Oh, okay. So please come up to Maine and have some of our famous lobster <laughs> and blueberry mm-hmm. pie. Mm-hmm. Yes, and it'll be up for the month. So Where is the show? In it's Maine? at Dowling Walsh Dowling Gallery Walsh. Okay. in Rockland, and it's right across the street from the Farnsworth Museum. Oh, mm, okay. Wonderful. Yep. All righty. Cool. I can tell you my favorite show that I've ever had, mm-hmm. and yeah. that was not... Uh, a long ago, two years ago, I had a show in Stockholm, and it was a retrospective, and there were five different galleries, or, you know, rooms, Ooh. and I worked on it with the curators for a year and a half, and I'm half Swedish on my grand, you know, my um, father's side, my grandparents <laughs> were born in Sweden, and that show were were all life size uh, women from my three books. Uh, transformations, light warriors, and wise women, and walking into that gallery with these, they looked like light boxes of life-size images, was to me the peak moment in my life, really. And hmm. I, I went with my son and my oldest granddaughter, and to walk into that and see it candle lit, <laughs> even though I had been, yeah. <laughs> Even though I had been uh, there and helping to set it up, to set it up and and at all, still when it was all done, and and actually, there's a little video on my homepage with that a three minute video of the opening. So please, yeah, take a look. You know, uh, and your website is just my last name, Tennyson.com. Okay. Okay. And spell Tennyson, please. T e n n e s o n. O n. Yes. That's yeah. right. Well, there was a famous poet called Alfred Lord yeah. Tennyson, yeah. and guess what? He used a Y. A y. Yeah. And do you know that my computer still tries to correct me? <laughs> 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 so, so does mine, but I'm not going to tell you what it calls also, me. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> this is, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> This All has right. been so fun. Yeah. Thank you guys Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for joining really us. All Great. Thanks for My pleasure. Okay, that wraps up another episode of the B&H Photography Podcast. We thank Keith Carter, Joyce Tennyson, and Doug Kirkland. And remind you to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And stay tuned for more details on our upcoming B&H Photography Podcast, Fujifilm X-H1 Sweepstakes. And as always, on behalf of John, Jason, and myself, thank you so much for joining us today.